I'm Erica Lynn, and we all know the ocean is the most demanding environment on Earth, consistently testing the reliability and durability of our equipment. When you spend as much time fishing as I do, you know that reliable gear is essential for staying on the water. This is why I went with Abyss Battery to power my trolling motor, electronics, and outboard. The guys at Abyss Battery are rattling the saltwater industry by manufacturing performance marine batteries specifically designed for sonar, outboards, trolling motors, and electronic fishing reels. They're also Bluetooth compatible, so I found check and battery statuses right on your phone while you're out on the water is a huge game changer. To learn more about why Abyss batteries are used by the pros and factory installed by Premier Boat Builders, visit abyssbattery.com. Taste the Mediterranean through March 19th at Whole Foods Market. Save on Animal Welfare Certified Bone and Beef Short Ribs, Sustainable Wild Caught Sockeye Salmon, and more. Find sales on Parmigiano Reggiano, Charcuterie and Ground Lamb, Grab an olive boule bread from the bakery. Plus, wines from the Mediterranean start at just $8.99. Taste the Mediterranean now at Whole Foods Market. Must be 21 plus. Please drink responsibly. Join Justin Townsend and the Harvesting Nature crew as they explore the world of cooking wild fish and game while sharing recipes, tips, tricks, and lessons learned from their pursuit of wild food. We sure hope you ate before the show, is you're going to leave hungry. This is the Wild Fish and Game Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome back to... Harvest Nature's Wild Fish and Game podcast. You got your host here, Justin Townsend, and uh, I am joined today by Adam. And today we're going <laughs> to. Never fails. Um, <laughs> today we're going to do a bit of a. We're going to do a butchering chat again and uh, cooking by cut. So this particular episode, we're going to talk about uh, the skirt steak and the flank steak, which um, have some interesting uh, uses, some interesting um, differences, but are still ultimately like really good cuts of meat. Um, I would say probably the skirt state on wild game is probably not utilized as much as you think it would be. Uh, and you'll understand why when we talk a little bit about uh, where it comes from. And then uh, I think the flank steak often gets referred to as the skirt steak, uh, which is interesting as well. And then sometimes they all get con- confused with the hanger steak, which ironically enough, we're not going to talk about in our cooking cooking with cuts because it's it's a little bit of a different cut. On, uh, on wild game. So lots of cool uh, cuts still in the center portion of the animal, but um, definitely varying in their uses. Um, and then next time we do a cooking by cut, which will be in a few weeks, uh, we're going to be talking about the top and the bottom round, which similarly are different, very contrasting cuts. Uh, so those could be exciting to discuss and chat about. Um and then we just wrapped up last week, um, actually, shoot, three days ago, our um, goose camp, um, snow goose camp in Missouri. And so that was a blast. I think we shot, Adam, I was doing the math to include the ones that we ate and everything. I think we shot between 70 and 80 geese total, which is pretty uh-huh. pretty phenomenal. If you think about that over the course of like basically two and a half days, Um Maybe three days if you count some of the other times, but uh, so pretty good, good for uh, us anyway. But we had a great time uh, learning, teaching everybody the shooting, the hunting, the cooking, and the butchering of snow geese. So I think we've about got a date on the books for next uh, go round, but uh, we're just waiting to firm up those last details for next year. Uh, so keep an eye out for that if you want to come join us. And then always we've got our pig camp in December. Um, outside of that, uh, kind of closing out waterfowl season, looking towards turkey season, uh, which will be here before we know it. And I'm going to keep my updates very short and sweet. So turn it over to you, Adam, whatever you got. It's going to be pretty short and sweet for me as well because I don't really have anything new to speak of. Uh 
other than just coming off the the high of that snow goose camp, which is another great success. Um, it's awesome because it's work with so many birds and, and, uh, kind of create meals out of a, just one species throughout the whole weekend. It was, yeah, just a really good time. So, um, but other than that, I've just been kind of kicking around and looking forward to maybe doing some more snow geese in the spring when they start to arrive in my neck of the woods up in Canada here. So I have a date set tentatively in April, I think Nice for a hunt with them. So, um, yeah, I've learned uh, quite a bit already from our last hunt or a couple days ago that I'm going to be bringing with me to uh, this one. So we'll see how different it is. I know there's not going to be any uh, pit blinds or anything like we used down south there. So it would be cool to contrast it to the two hunts. And um, I was going to say this too, that uh, actually you reminded me, I still have one goose hanging in my uh, garage, which I need to butcher tonight it's probably day four plus i'm a little concerned the temperatures have been getting up a little warm for the last two days so uh i'm hoping that everything's not spoiled on that that fella uh or lady i don't know what it is so um and the other thing oh, i was gonna tell everybody too our next actually our next podcast that you'll hear will actually be a live podcast from goose camp that we did with all the guests uh, of the camp, just kind of re uh, recounting what we did during that uh, few days. And you get kind of their opinions and, and their thoughts on, on things like the food and the hunting and the shooting and all that other stuff. It was a, I had a really good time with the podcast. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Lots of good laughs as well. Uh, lots of joshing on me, uh, which I think is also hilarious. <laughs> Um, but let's get down to the meat and potatoes. Um, so first up on the chopping block, uh, is the skirt steak. So as we talk about the skirt steak, um, let's talk about kind of what a skirt steak is. And so it's a long, thin cut of meat. Um, it actually has two parts the inside skirt steak and the outside skirt steak, which is going to be very confusing when I tell you uh, what that actually means and not that it refers to like an inside and outside of, uh, of the location. Uh, so it's also called the Romanian tenderloin, which strikes me as very odd. The Romanian steak, the Philadelphia steak, and the Arachara. Am I saying that right? I'm not sure. My Spanish isn't. There we go. Uh, anyway, so uh, which that's a very popular cut. We'll talk about that in just a minute, too. Um, it's super flavorful. Uh, it's also a very tender cut, and it usually contains loose grains and in domestic animals is very well marbled. Um, if you're going to a butcher counter and you're going to order a domestic cut of skirt steak, I recommend you order the outside skirt skate. Skirt, oh, I'm going to do this the whole time. Outside skirt steak versus the inside skirt steak because the inside skirt steak is more chewy, but it is still edible. You just have to prepare it differently. So most of what we will be referring to in this episode is going to be the outside skirt steak, but understanding the size of the skirt steak on a deer or even an elk is much smaller than that of a, uh, a domestic cow or steer is going just understand that, that it's probably going to be ch more challenging to differentiate, differentiate between the outside and inside skirt steak. So also too, I mentioned this earlier, which I think is pretty fascinating is the fact that, um, the, the term skirt steak gets thrown around a lot. Um, if you go on to Google and you search skirt steak or venison skirt steak, how to remove a venison skirt steak or anything, what pop or anything, something similar. Let me see what pops up the first in mind. How to remove a venison skirt steak. The first thing that pops up is a uh, meat eater. And uh, 
he's removing it's it's a YouTube video that says how to remove a venison hide quarter. And when you click on it, as I'm going to here in just a second, you can't hear it, but I can. <laughs> he's gonna cut out the skirt state and he's tapping what is really the flank stake. So even at the top, things get a little confusing. So uh, that's just a good example of, of some misuse of the term skirt versus flank. Um, and so uh, let's clarify why there's a difference. So on beef, the skirt is part of the plate section. Uh, and the plate section is under the main section of ribs. Um, and under, I don't mean like top to bottom, like the spine is at the top of the animal and the skirt stake is at the bottom of the animal. No, I mean like under the ribs, like inside the rib cage. Um, the skirt stake actually connects to the diaphragm. Uh, so the skirt skate skirt steak is located inside the rib cage, uh, attached to the inner wall of the rib cage, um, which is pretty interesting. Um, on deer and elk, it's still in the same location. It's under the ribs, but it's just much smaller because Adam, why? Because they're, they're all smaller. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I took you. Your- you might see a larger one on a on a moose or bison, yeah. But even still, they're gonna be quite a bit smaller than a steer. Yeah, yeah. Wait, 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 wait. So, which is why I said earlier they're probably commonly overlooked, is because um, as folks are are dealing with them, uh, dealing with rib cages, things like that, you're probably just gonna take what meat you can and go off, and people are likely going to just. Uh, go over the diaphragm thinking it's part of the offal, which is an interesting um, point uh, of conversation in just a moment. But uh, if you yourself are going to focus on keeping the skirt steak, it's really easy. All you do is you go inside the rib cage, you locate the diaphragm, find the muscle that connects the along the rib cage to the diaphragm and just kind of peel that away uh, from the ribs themselves. It should come off fairly easy because it'll just be some connective tissue and stuff that binds it together. And the fact that it's pretty tender, it's not going to require a lot of cutting, but you can use your knife to follow the inside contour of the ribs to get that cut out, which is, uh, which will be very useful. The diaphragm will likely be attached, which is okay. You can leave the diaphragm attached if you like. You can still cook and eat it. It is, in fact, just a muscle. Um, so, there is that. Adam, did I miss anything on those so far? Um, I don't believe so. My dog is going a little wild here, so I've been a little distracted. <laughs> it's fair. She's not impressed that we're doing a podcast right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell her this is what buys her the... This is what buys her the kibbles and bits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, a little bit on the culinary history. So this cut has been around uh, for a while um, in like common use in common terms, uh, as we mentioned earlier there. Uh, since the 19th century, um, you said it, it, it looks pleated like a skirt, which is how it gets its name, which makes sense. The skirt steak. Uh, Not that it is a part of the skirt of an animal, uh, which could also be why people think about it. Kind of that flank steak is because that kind of is like a skirt once you have a carcass like hanging, right? Um, The cut of meat was a favorite of vaqueros and cowboys, uh, probably due to its um, ease to remove and uh, tenderness and it's quick to cook on the grill and takes really well to flavors. Um, it's also a traditional cut for a lot of Mexican food, um, to include fajitas and other cuts that are prepared very quickly on the grill. Um, I've had it a number of ways and it is a super tasty, tasty cut. I also thought it was interesting that it's, uh, 
it was the meat preferred to be used in Cornish uh, pasties, uh, which. <laughs> <laughs> Pa- pasties, I think people. I've gotten yelled at before. Sorry, I heard, I heard your your, your dog squeak its toy yeah. in the background. That's what. <laughs> oh, jeez, there she goes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go on mute for a little while there. <laughs> sure. Oh. Um. Oh, that's good. So it uh. That was the meat of choice used for uh, Cornish pasties or pasties, uh, which has some interesting history here in Colorado because uh, we have like the gold and silver mines uh, out west from Denver up in like Idaho Springs area. And um, that was a part of the population that came and uh, began doing a lot of the mining. So uh, you can go there up in that part of uh, Colorado and, and have some pasties or pasties there's also a a brewery up there uh that's dedicated to the miners as well um it has some cool english style or cornish style uh beers which is very tasty also but i mentioned earlier this cuts great for grilling so you can throw it on the grill uh it does take well to marinades um that's largely due to the loose and coarse grains as well as the fact that it's thin. Um, we hit on that a lot about the penetrability of marinades, uh, but that too, those loose coarse grains help hold some of that flavor in while you're cooking. I think like this is also the carne asada cut. Yeah, I've read both the skirt and the flank have been called that, but I'm not sure. Yep. Not familiar enough with Mexican cooking to say for sure. I love, I love carne asada, so... It's it's both. So I would say different different from fajitas in the fact that the carne asada has a particular uh, marinade that you're using to to cook it with. But yeah, I think I've had it with both the flank and the skirt. So it's pretty tasty. And then also, last but not least, you can always pan sear it, uh, which is a good way to do it too if you're going to cook it. So I think you touched on the mar- marinating, like how well it takes to marinate, mm-hmm. and. Uh... Talk, like you said, we talked a lot a lot about it before, but the just the very fact that it's so thin of a cut means that the marinade is penetrating from both sides pretty much right to the middle. And especially with those like loose coarse grains, you're actually the skirt is probably your prime cut for marinating. Um, if you got like a whole big sirloin tip roast or something marinating overnight in the fridge, it's gonna penetrate like an eighth of an inch tops. Uh, it's not going to do much. It might flavor it a little bit, but it's not going to do any any uh, tenderization or anything special to it. But a skirt steak it can make a big impact. So these are the cuts that you like. You can really um, play with the marinade and get it to do something special. So I say it's like one of the one of the top ones for that. Which I think is ironic because if if you think about cuts, I see, uh, and I wanted to talk about this because I'm on this group on Facebook and I just stumbled on it and I like to get on these group cause I like to share some of our stuff on there, but this particular group it's called venison recipes. It's almost always never anyone, uh, sharing actual recipes. It's either pictures of food or people are like, can I take venison tips and put them in the crock pot? Uh, was one I read today and I was like, venison tips. Okay. Are you talking about like tri tips? Are you talking, like what? What are you, what are you talking about here? And uh, everybody kind of like had their thoughts of it. And I'm noticing a trend with this group too. One, uh, the, there's a lot of folks that need a lot of of help in the world of venison, and there's a lot of misinformation, just like any Facebook group. I feel like, but it's also very common. I think the go to recipes that I've seen, uh, and you'll appreciate this, are. The uh, Mississippi roast, which we happen to have, I think, one of the best recipes for venison Mississippi roast because we don't use the packets. Um, It's all like whole ingredients. And the second most frequently seen one is, um, what is it? It's like a can of beer, the Lipton soup packet, uh, which... That I thought you would like because your mm-hmm. your uh, previous antler and fin mention of it, um, 
and then like some yeah. sort of like vegetable aromatic and starch thrown in there. And uh, that's generally like people's go to for cooking any type of cut that resembles a roast of venison. And then today I was reading, I was scrolling through and people were talking about tenderizing uh, or they weren't talking about tenderizing. They were talking about taking the tips and putting them, put meat tenderizer on them, unseasoned meat tenderizer on them for an hour and then throwing them into the crock pot and cooking. And then, yeah, I was like, that's a, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, lots of things going on there. And then somebody else was like, do you think it would help to soak it in milk before we put it in the crock pot? And that when I was like, I'm going to answer this one. And I was like, no, don't do that. Um, but yeah, definitely some interesting things going on in there. But I, I say all that to say that um, the cuts you see people like wanting to marinate are like roasts. And like cuts off the back strap or the loin. And like this is this is the perfect cut for it. Like marinate this cut. It, it, it's like it's perfect. It's seen 200 years of evolution in the kitchen for marinades. Like Mexican cuisine has perfected the marinade for this. <laughs> so... Let's yeah, exactly. let's stop throwing loin steaks in there and let's think about the let's think about both the flank steak and the skirt steak when we're thinking about marinating. And I hope that uh people following this series kind of pick that up. I hope anyways that each individual part of the animal it has different applications that work perfectly for it. And if you follow that your your cooking your food just becomes so much better. Cooking's easier, things taste better, things are less tough you just use those specific cuts where they're supposed to be used you'll be like just amazed at how much better everything is instead of just taking random hunks of deer and throwing them on the grill or in the crock pot um there's 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 parts that are perfect for the crock pot there's parts that are perfect for the grill and there's parts that are perfect for marinating and and that's what we're trying to get at here yeah yeah sorry that was a bit of a rant actually i won't apologize (laughs) it was well earned um yeah, I, I I think I'd be curious, folks out there, if you are a skirt steak keeper, not a flank steak keeper, uh, reach out and let me know what you do to it. You know, Hit me up on Instagram at Adventures for Food, or you can message the Harvest in Nature Instagram is a good way too. But really curious uh, if you guys are utilizing the skirt steak on, on deer and elk and moose and bison and, and what have you. Um just curious in general, or I mean, if, if too, if you're like, I cut that out and I throw it in the grind pile, like perfectly acceptable. I think about like backcountry processing as well, like getting the quarters, deboning the quarters, taking the meat off the ribs, like all that stuff. I don't know that I would particularly set this cut aside. It may just end up in a bag full of like trim and then just be destined for the grinder just out of the fact that it's coming out of the backcountry like far enough that I, I don't want to take the time to break down ribs and pack them out or to take this cut off the ribs and like have a Ziploc bag and label it. So just curious in general, if people are using this, but I just like these, the tips, <laughs> the skirt steak tips. <laughs> also, those are get the, them, get them tenderized. the same, the same, uh, backstrap tips, right? I'm going to use yeah, those too. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> great. Thanks. Just don't forget to meet tenderizer. On average, it takes about 30 days for a person to break their New Year's resolution. So if saving money was on your 2024 list, your odds aren't really looking that great. Luckily, I have a 100% guaranteed way to save you money this year. Just switch to Mint Mobile right now. Mint Mobile has wireless plans starting at just $15 a month. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. If you save as much as I think you're going to, you are going to be able to afford a brand new rod and reel. Use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and keep your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. To get your new wireless plan for 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. That's mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash waypoint. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details.
Taste the Mediterranean through March 19th at Whole Foods Market. Save on animal welfare certified bone-in beef short ribs, sustainable wild-caught sockeye salmon, and more. Find sales on Parmigiano-Reggiano, charcuterie and ground lamb. Grab an olive boule bread from the bakery. Plus, wines from the Mediterranean start at just $8.99. Taste the Mediterranean now at Whole Foods Market. Must be 21 plus. Please drink responsibly. Let's see. So let's move on to the flank steak uh, for just a minute. Or actually, it'll be longer than a minute. So grab a drink and sit back. <laughs> um, so, uh, Adam, I'll let you. Do you want to run with this one a little bit? And I'll, I'll interject uh, in and out. Sure. So the flank steak, uh, it's called, often called a jiffy steak. Um, it's sometimes called the bavette in French, although in some parts of France, the bavette means something slightly different. There's a lot of terminology linked to the uh, cuts around this cut, uh, but it can sometimes be labeled as a bavette. Uh, bavette, I believe, means bib in French, and it's also called a bib sometimes. Um and then London broil, which you've probably all seen before. Uh, London broil is also, um, there's other cuts also labeled London broil at times as well. Just making these cuts totally confusing when you're, when you're out looking around <laughs> online. <laughs> it's a long kind of flat cut. Uh, the, the grains are running down, down the entire cut from tip to tip. Um, it's kind of got long, very, um, obvious grains quite loose it's uh, quite a bit tougher than the skirt although it is um leaner and has less um connective tissue in it for the most part um like the skirt but not quite as much it's very flavorful so the skirt steak has a ton of flavor and uh it's a muscle that's being used all the time it's kind of helps with the animal breathing attached to the diaphragm where the flank is kind of more the like the abs of the animal uh, so there are all the twisting, jumping, whatever is going to, um, be using that flank. And so it's going to be used quite, uh, quite a bit, has a lot of blood running through it and therefore is quite flavorful. Um, it's located, you kind of take the, the lower chest or the, the plate that, um, Justin was talking about. Um, it's the abdominal muscle located just behind that plate and in front of the rear quarter. So it's going to be on kind of the bottom of the animal. Uh, when you split the animal, you'll have flank on either side for the most part. So basically like the back of the ribs to the back of the leg, uh, upward exactly. to the spine. And then generally in wild game, as you split it down the middle, it's and you peel it open and you break the ribs open, you're going to follow that down. And you're going to have two distinct sort of like flaps of meat. Uh, and if you cut them off, they'll be kind of like, I don't know, kind of large clam shape cuts. So they'll be flat. Yeah, like an elongated yeah. clam. Yeah. Um, um, when you when you split that animal, kind of like Justin mentioned before, they almost can be seen as a skirt mm -hmm. kind of flapping off the bottom of the deer, which I think it must be why it is so often called the skirt, um, erroneously, because it is not. Is it a flank? Um it can be quite thick on beef, and it makes like a really nice big steak on from a steer. Uh, you can get that a little bit from like a once again a moose or a bison or something very large, a little bit on elk. But the smaller the animal you get, like a uh, white tail or an antelope, you're going to get a much smaller, thinner cut. Um, yeah, an antelope they're super thin. Yeah. So, did you want to describe how to cut it off the animal? Sure. So it's kind of just the way we were saying. Yeah. So essentially, like if you've got your animal split down the middle and you've got it, uh, we'll just say you've got it hung up. Um, you've got it hung up by its feet. So it's backwards. So you're essentially going to go down to where you find your last rib in the rib cage and you're going to cut back towards the spine and you're going to follow that muscle uh, upward along the spine until it intersects with kind of the back leg. And then you're just going to continue to follow it as it comes back around, uh, back to your original cut. And then you pull it off. The only thing is you're going to have silver skin on both the outside and the inside of that cut. So you really have to determine what you're going to do with that silver skin. If you want to leave it, if you want to remove it, if you want to do whatever in order to use the cut. Um, 
and you just repeat on the other side. And essentially, then you end up with this big, like, oval, half oval shape space where it was on the animal uh, with both the bottom part of the rib exposed and the spine exposed and then where it connected into the leg. Okay. And if you're if you're planning on freezing it right away, uh, I would just leave that silver skin on since it's mm-hmm. quite a thin cut to begin with. It's quite prone to freezer burn, and that silver skin just adds another small layer of protection against silver or uh, freezer burn. So you can remove it when you thaw it out and you're ready to go. If you're planning on grilling or cooking it, I would quickly. If you're planning on braising it, just let it go. I would also roll it if you're going to freeze it. So that you have less Ooh, exposed to the outside, um, but less potential for freezer burn. So, great idea. Yeah. In terms of the culinary history, there's actually very little to be found on this cut, which is interesting. Uh, a lot of the cuts that we've done in the past on the series have had really interesting historical references, and certain countries have have prized it over others. And there's actually very little to be found on this cut, which. I found quite interesting because it's a well-known cut. Like it's not a, I wouldn't say it's a hidden cut by any means. Like most people know what a flank is. Um, The bavette and pieces of the flank are highly prized in France where they tend to cut their, their, they do their cuts much smaller than we do in in North America. So they'll have like for every one or two of our cuts, they'll have like five or six of them. Uh, So they end up with a lot more smaller, interesting cuts, Uh, but they really like that area. Um, Mexico is famous for skirt steaks and flank steaks. I think they do them right. And in South America, actually, there's a lot of history um, with um, Spanish words. I'm not going to attempt and butcher on this. Uh, (laughs) And so in Argentina, Colombia, they have a lot of rich history of using this flank cut in their dishes. Also in, in Asia, particularly China, the flank is often used as a stir fry cut mm. uh, due to its um, due to its loose grains. It is easily marinated just like the skirt. Um, they do have a lot of similarities, these two cuts and they can be thin, sliced thinly and velveted. We've probably talked about velveting a hundred times already, but it's basically adding uh cornstarch or baking soda or something to, to marinate the meat, which kind of tenderizes it and, um, opens up the meat fibers, so it's it's moist and tender and really soaks up marinades better. Um, it gives you that like uh, takeout kind of texture in the meat. And flank will be used if it's if it's a beef dish, it's most likely flank in a stir fry. Um, and Koreans have used it quite a bit as well in their kind of grilling applications. So. The, the cut does make its way around the world, but there's not too much of a, an actual history uh, behind it. The cooking of it, is, it's interesting because you think about uh, the skirt steak being very tender. And as we mentioned, this one's not as tender. Um, but I think it's also equally versatile in what you can do with it. So you could braise it. So in that, think about like a fall apart steak uh, with like gravy over mashed potatoes, um, any kind of like, I think, thick sauce on it. But really, because it's got those long grains, too, you could like shred it. So I think of things like, uh, geez, like you could do probably like Italian sandwiches with it, uh, you know, kind of like Chicago uh, style like we had at Goose Camp. I think that that would be a cool cut for that, yeah. or even like like a uh, ropa vieja from like Cuban food, or um, you know, some other really like stringy meat dishes would be good too. But like really saucy, uh, saucy, sassy meat dishes, um, is what I'm thinking. Um, you can also sear it until medium rare and slice it against the grain. And we talk a lot about slicing it against the grain and because you're shortening those long grains when you slice it across, which makes it easier to chew. And then, uh, as Adam mentioned, for the stir fry, so slicing it as thin as you can and, and getting that velveting technique in there uh, to help tenderize it. And then, of course, sticking true to the Latin roots, tacos, fajitas, carne asada, which I tell you, man, carne asada is like one of my absolute favorites. Um, 
We also have a really good like venison taco recipe that's an adaptation of carne asada uh, on the website that's really, really good. I don't know if it made the cut. I think it did for recipes we'll talk about here in just a minute. Uh, but this would be a great cut for that as well. Uh, you got bulgogi. So that's also like super thinly sliced and cooked uh, with a lot of really flavorful sauces. And then uh, we've got it uh, thinly sliced and then and then put onto skewers uh, like Nigerian suya, uh, which is a good recipe. I've actually prepared it here recently. Um and satay, which is another, uh, it's not Nigerian, but it's another skewer type recipe that's really good. So you have those uh, marinated thin cuts of meat that you're grilling and then brushing on with extra sauce. So I still think though that even with this cut, if you're going to get it thin, expect more bite out of it than you would um, the, the skirt steak, which is okay. It's good. Just understand like you're going to get a little bit more of a like chewy flavor but not as chewy as like some other cuts we've discussed so i think if you go at it in those ways i think you'll really find yourself satisfied i think flank has a pleasant chew rather than an annoying one if i don't know if you know what i mean by Mm -hmm. that but there's some it gives a little more resistance but it doesn't just get stuck in your mouth you're chewing on it forever it's not like grisly or anything it just has like it's just has a certain meaty chewiness that you don't get in uh, tender cuts, but I find quite enjoyable all the same. Yeah. And I think too, it's like you get a little bit of chew and then it melts, which is fine. Um, You know, I think, I think when you want that and some dishes are really good with that too. Ah, yes. The magnificent trolley sour bright crawler, also known as Trollicus brightolus. The worm's captivating neon colour makes it an easy gummy prey. Trolley! It's a surprisingly sour, invitingly chewy, staggeringly snackable species unlike anything else found on this planet. Eat me! Delicious. Visit trolley.com to shop now. Trolley, eat me! This episode is brought to you by Coca-Cola Spiced. Introducing Coca-Cola Spiced, an unexpected taste journey with bursts of raspberry and spiced flavors. It's a refreshing, unique twist on Coca-Cola's iconic taste. Take your taste buds on an adventure and try new Coca-Cola Spiced for yourself today. Copyright 2024, The Coca-Cola Company. Let's go a little bit. Let's go a little bit into some food. We've got a, a good amount of time here to talk about food, which is good. So let's we'll go through these. So I think I'll take the first one here. Um, this is a classic, classic harvesting nature recipe from back in 2014, and this is a smoky Southwest venison flank steak with wild game barbecue sauce. Uh, wild game barbecue sauce is something of my own creation. Um, And then the smoky Southwest bit alludes to the seasoning. So in this, we're taking uh, this, the flank steak here and let me scroll down. Interesting. Uh, So we've got our dry rub, uh, smoked paprika, garlic, black pepper, ancho chili, chipotle chili, chili powder, ground mustard, sea salt, cumin, uh, onion powder, and some red pepper flakes. So really like a good chili based, uh, seasoning, um, which is, which is really super tasty. And so you mix all those and you rub down the meat to create a nice heavy coating. Um, if there's not enough, you just recreate the, the spice. Um, and then you're going to use one flank steak. Uh, so that would be the big, uh, the big cut from one side, coat it in that. And then, uh, it says heat, heat, uh, your smoker to about 200, 250 degrees, and then place the meat on the smoker and cook for two hours, rotating it every hour. Um, and then I said to cook it to medium. Really, so this is, I think, uh, uh, something you could do on a grill too um, as well or even pans here. Just understand you're going to crisp up those spices a lot. And then uh, allow pull it off, allow it to rest, and then uh, 
hit it with your barbecue sauce, which you're likely going to make, which has a ton of ingredients here. Let's see. Onion, garlic, butter, ketchup, vinegar, water, honey, brown sugar, salt, black pepper, chili powder, smoked paprika, Tabasco, cayenne pepper, uh, a little bit of liquid smoke, and some crushed red pepper flakes. So pretty straightforward recipe. Something easy if you've got the cut and you just want something, uh, something to cook pretty quickly. Uh, the sauce can cook while you're, you're grilling the meat. So that'll be good stuff. I don't know. Adam, why don't you take the next one? What's yours? Sure. Yeah. This is one of my recipes on the Harvest Nature website um, called the Chinese venison and snow peas stir fry. And I really like this one because it's super fast, super easy. It's healthy and delicious, making it excellent for like a weeknight meal kind of weeknight family meal rather than like a big special presentation. Um, so I used a uh, flank steak, like a venison flank. But another good thing about this recipe is it's pretty changeable and riffable. You can use, you know, kind of any wild game, including like anything from grouse to goose to um, elk to deer, whatever you wanted, anything would work. And you could also change up the veggies. So if you don't like snow peas, you could use sugar snap peas or peppers or zucchini or spinach or kale or beans, asparagus, celery. Um, you can even use like tougher vegetables like broccoli or carrots. But um, I was just blanching them in water for a couple minutes first. Uh, so this this recipe can just go anywhere. It's basically like a, a blueprint. Um, it employs the velveting technique. So you're taking your flank, about half a pound of flank steak, and slicing it very thinly. And if, you, if you're not too comfortable with knives or your knives aren't all that sharp, one thing you can do is put the meat in the freezer for like uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and that will make slicing it way easier. You'll be able to slice it thinly and it will just coat the shape on you. It's not, it won't be like wobbling it around. Uh, once you slice it thin, you um, mix it with some baking soda and just let that sit for a little bit while you prepare your rice and chop your vegetables. And then marinate it um, with a little bit of soy sauce, some Shaoxing wine, which is a Chinese rice wine. You could use like a cooking sherry or something in its stead. Uh, some sesame oil and a little bit of cornstarch. Uh, give that a couple more minutes to marinate. It won't take long. Um, and you're just going to heat up some fat. I usually use lard in a, a wok. If you don't have a wok, I recommend using like a large cast iron skillet maybe or something that can take a lot of high heat. And you're going to want it ripping hot. That's a good thing. About, thing about stir fries is you don't want it like medium heat and just everything like boiling and braising in there forever. You're going to want to cook at a really high heat and really quickly. So you're going to want to have all of your ingredients and everything you'll need for the stir fry right beside the wok. And it's going to happen all within five minutes. Uh, so you hit the venison into the oil, uh, toss around for a couple minutes, add the snow peas, stir fry for maybe a minute. And then the sauce is just a combination. It's like a basic Chinese stir fry sauce. And that has soy sauce, oyster sauce, uh, garlic, white sugar, black pepper, or white pepper. Uh, some venison stock and some cornstarch. If you don't have all those ingredients, you could also just buy a store bought um, stir fry sauce or your favorite kind of thing. Yeah, but uh, that's, add that's it. no fun. <laughs> it's no fun. But this is supposed to be an easy meal, so yeah. I'll let it. Okay. I'll let it slide. <laughs> all right, thank you, Adam. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so then you just add it to the wok and take it off the heat, and it will kind of bubble down in like thirty seconds, and then you have your stir fry super easy and it's going to be different than the stir fries you may have grown up with. If you haven't had any good kind of Chinese influence in your life, it's going to be like tender crisp. It's going to be super flavorful. Everything's going to stand out on its own. It's going to be really interesting. It's, it's delicious. Sounds delicious. Let's see. Uh, you want to hit this one too, the bulgogi and then I'll hit up the Venice tacos after that. Sure. So this is a bulgogi recipe from Jeff Benda. He uses pronghorn antelope in it. And uh, bulgogi is a, a marinated Korean meat that's often used in uh, 
bibimbap, which is a Korean di- like rice dish that has meat and a bunch of veggies that all get mixed around. Uh, but bulgogi can go in a lot of different places. Just think of like saucy, thinly sliced, grilled, marinated meat. Uh, you can stuff it into a taco or a burrito or, I don't know, onto rice or noodles. It's just delicious. Um, so Jeff here takes, uh, he just says a steak, but I, I would use flank for this. Um, slice it thinly across the grain. Uh, you're going to give it a marinade in some soy sauce, brown sugar, sesame oil, garlic, ginger, and gochujang. And gochujang is a spicy fermented red pepper paste used in a lot of Korean cooking. You know, let that marinate for about an hour. Just let it all get through. I'm um, going to make some rice for the side and then uh, heat up a large cast iron skillet over medium high heat. Add half of the meat to sear in a single layer. I'm going to let it sear for about three minutes, transfer to a large plate, and then repeat with the remaining half. The reason you break that apart like that into two batches, or even more if you have a lot, is if you throw all of the meat into the pan at the same time, it's just going to start to braise, like I mentioned with that stir fry. Uh, and you want it to sear. So in order to sear, the pan needs to remain hot, and there needs to be a little bit of space in between the meat. If you throw it on at once, it cools down the pan, there's no space. It just turns into a mess. So so be patient and brown in batches. Um, and that's about it. So you just uh, scoop some rice onto a plate, divide the meat up, and sauce with the uh, leftover sauce, and just uh, garnish with some green onions. It's uh, another simple, delicious meal. I think, too, we're, we're like on a, a string of simple but delicious meals. And I was looking at this recipe, and I think uh, this is recipe – that is based off uh, venison tacos that we used to serve at Mellow Cafe back when I was executive chef uh, in QST. And I think it's actually missing an orange juice element uh, because the recipe is very similar to carne asada. Um, and so essentially you've got your tortillas naturally, uh, two pounds of venison. I didn't specify what in there. So you could use anything from like, um, some of your other steak cuts to you could definitely 100% use either the flank or the skirt uh, in this recipe. Uh, you're going to create a marinade out of olive oil, soy sauce, lime juice, uh, apple cider vinegar, sugar, black pepper, cumin, garlic cloves, a jalapeno, and cilantro. And I'm almost 95% sure there's a bit of orange juice in there too. That's the like carne asada back element but i could be mistaken all i know is i this dish is very tasty uh we served as specials a lot um but you uh you whisk all those things together that i mentioned and then you place the the steak in the marinade let it coat thoroughly cover it in plastic wrap let it refrigerate overnight or a couple hours uh you can either do it I say in here, cast iron skillet. You can do it in cast iron skillet or you can do it on the grill. Either way, or really, really good. Um, warm up your tortillas and then garnish it with uh, some uh, coleslaw. I recommend like a purple slaw. Um, you could do lettuce. You could do uh, salsa verde on top, queso fresco, and uh, pickled purple onion. And uh, you are not going to regret that. It is like a phenomenal, very easy, very straightforward, very flavorful recipe. Because as we mentioned, both of these cuts taste take very, very well to that. Uh, that. And let's see. Um, you want to hit on the next one? Sure. So this is a recipe off uh, the Intrepid Eater website. And it's another Korean one. Um and this is one of my favorite Korean dishes, actually. There was a place when I, I used to live in Toronto, and there was this Korean place in Little Korea and or Korea Town, and um, I think it was called Bak Cheng Dong Sun Tofu. <laughs> and it sold this uh, Sun Dobu Jigai. And I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. I hope I am. And that's basically a soft tofu stew. Um, and it's this kind of bowl of piping hot, uh, bright red, spicy stew that has this like silken tofu in it and lots of meat or seafood and kimchi. And it was just incredible. I brought all my friends there and uh, absolutely loved it. So when I moved away from Toronto, I had to recreate it. 
and I thought I would do so with venison and actually use the venison skirt steak. So it's perfect for this podcast. Um, it's good, so it was good, good forethought. Skirt steak and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thinking ahead. Oh, there's the <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I'm going to take a skirt steak and I'm going to slice it thinly against the grain. I'm going to heat some vegetable oil with a little bit of sesame oil to season it into a wok or a deep skillet and sear it just for a minute. We're not looking for like super brown meat in this situation, uh, just kind of cooking it through slightly. Um, adding a bunch of sliced onions and some garlic and scallions. And then we're going to hit that up with a bunch of venison stock, uh, soy sauce, fish sauce, which is commonly used in Korean cooking, gochujang, which I mentioned before, and gochugaru, which are basically like a Korean type of pepper flake. So just a red pepper flake similar to um, the Italian chili flakes without the actual seeds. It's a little um, deeper and kind of fruitier flavor. Uh, and then you're adding some kimchi, homemade if possible, and stirring it all together, bringing that to a very strong simmer, and then adding your silken tofu. And this recipe doesn't work with like firm tofu. You have to use silken, uh, which is almost comes across like super tender egg whites or something. It's really actually tasty. I know a lot of people in the hunting world don't get along great with tofu, but it definitely has a place, especially beside meat, actually, which it's where it really shines. Uh and then that's all that you're going to do. You're going to ladle it into bowls while it's still really hot. You're going to drop an egg yolk into each bowl while it's still bubbling. And you'll mix that egg yolk into the stew while it's still hot. And it'll kind of cook um, as you stir it in. And that's often served with uh, forbidden rice, which is kind of a purple, like a really nice purple nutty rice. And uh, it's just such a delicious, big, robust dish. And it's great for that heavily flavored skirt steak really stands up to that um those big flavors and uh yeah i really like that dish a lot you want to hit on the next one too and then i'll close this out on the last one sure so i just had one of my earliest intrepid eater recipes um it's funny when you look back at your early recipes you see things that you would change but i would still make this um i think i just arrived back from mexico at this point and i wanted to eat more street tacos because I'd been eating a whole bunch of them. So I created some with uh, venison flank, although you could use script for this as well, I think. I uh, basically just uh, marinated the um, marinated steak in a, some salt and lime. So just really basic marinade. Uh, let that go for a few hours. Um, made like um, a pico de gallo to go with it. Uh, some slice some radishes. I think I had some nice garden radishes, like watermelon ones. I had some golden candy cane beets, which kind of can f- fit in with radishes too, if you want something really colorful. Um, prepare all that. Take the steak out of the marinade. Place on a super hot grill or an oiled and heated cast iron pan or griddle. Cook on high. Those black tops or flat tops would work really nice for that too. Cook on high heat. Um, about f- Depending on the thickness of your flank, about five minutes per side. Uh, if you're dealing with a smaller animal, you might be down to one minute per side for medium rare. Let it rest. Uh, heat up your tortillas and then just throw the steak on with some onions, radishes, and a little, little pico if you want. And they're just simple, beautiful little tacos. And I'll, I'll keep on the taco trend here and uh, talk about one of Hank Shaw's recipes. So over at uh at honestfood.net or if you look it up it's hunt gather cook and that is the arachera i said it right that time that's not good thank you <laughs> um basically his rendition of that uh which is just a super delicious so his marinade soy sauce uh lager uh, zest of two limes, black pepper, cayenne, garlic powder. Super simple, but super flavorful. Um, and then you're going to have your, your marinade, your skirt steak in that. And then uh, you will garnish it with uh, white onion, lime juice. You'll use some olive oil for the skirt steak and cilantro for garnish as well on uh, some flour or corn tortillas. 
So another like super simple, straightforward recipe that's very, very, very tasty. Um, I think anybody making any of these, and I love the fact that our trend went towards tacos for this podcast. I'm a big taco fan, and I'll remind everybody, we have the coolest venison taco shirt uh, around. If you go look on our website, it's uh, pretty cool. We've got a trout taco, too. And we're thinking about expanding the taco line to some other cuts as well. So if you like the taco shirts, uh, be sure to let us know what you want for the next species. And we'll, we'll get our, our, uh, art experts working on that. Um, but I think we covered pretty much everything in this episode as it relates to these two very, uh, cross used cuts that are also very different. Um, and I, I'm glad we broke these down and, uh, you know, can spread sort of some understanding with it, but I'll go over to you, Adam, any last thoughts or alibis or misfires that you have? Well, you can see from the trends of the, of the recipes that we picked, uh, that there's a lot of bold flavors. There's like Mexican, Korean, there's lots of citrus, there's onions, there's fish sauce, there's, uh, gochujang like these two cuts have a lot of flavor a lot more so than some other cuts from like the hindquarters or even the the back straps or loins and uh they can stand up to some big flavors and i recommend you you run with that and make something really cool from a place that ha- that uses big flavors in their cuisine and you just can't go wrong with it use some marinades uh, make tacos, make Korean tacos. Just do the best, best of both worlds. There you go. Uh, do something cool with it. Yeah. Yeah, no, great advice. Um, I think too, like my sort of last words, last thoughts are like, um, you know, when you have the time, slow down and just poke around the animal, uh, the carcass and just learn, you know, cause like I mentioned earlier, like these cuts could easily be blown by and just tossed as trim or tossed as grind. But if you want to kind of utilize them for something uh, that's going to be really good, really flavorful. uh, And I think a lot of your friends, family, and even you are going to enjoy, like just take the time, cut out the skirt, take the time, cut off the flank uh, and just like go through the motions of just like, moving through the animal make yourself a list of what you want to cut um and think through things before you even put a knife to a a cooled down hanging carcass uh i think that that's my last thoughts of the day so thanks everybody for listening um glad uh glad we got to cover these two topics as i mentioned and uh our show notes will be online we'll throw links in there to all the recipes and and um the shirt and things like that, the goose camp things that we mentioned and talked about tonight. And then make sure you head over to social media, give Adam a follow the intrepid eater, self a follow adventure for food, always follow harvesting nature because it's the best. And then uh, whatever podcast platform you're listening to, please punch that five star button. Uh, leave us a review. Tell us we're doing wrong or, you know, tell us we're doing right. Thanks everybody. Have a good night.